Part One, Section Fifteen of the Maine Woods by Henry David Thoreau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part One, Jasuncook, Section Fifteen. Such were the first rude beginnings of a town. They spoke of the practicability of a winter road to the Moosehead Carry, which would not cost much and would connect them with steam and staging and all the busy world i almost doubted if the lake would be there the self-same lake preserve its form and identity when the shores should be cleared and settled as if these lakes and streams which explorers report never awaited the advent of the citizen the sight of one of these frontier houses built of these great logs whose inhabitants have unflinchingly maintained their ground many summers and winters in the wilderness reminds me of famous forts like ticonderoga or crown point which have sustained memorable sieges they are especially winter quarters and at this season this one had a partially deserted look as if the siege were raised a little the snowbanks being melted from before it and its garrison accordingly reduced i think of their daily food as rations it is called supplies a bible and a greatcoat are munitions of war and a single man seen about the premises is a sentinel on duty you expect that he will require the countersign and will perchance take you for ethan allen come to demand the surrender of his fort in the name of the continental congress it is a sort of ranger service arnold's expedition is a daily experience with these settlers they can prove that they were out at almost any time and i think that all the first generation of them deserve a pension more than any that went to the mexican war early the next morning we started on our return up the penobscot my companion wishing to go about twenty-five miles above the moosehead carry to a camp near the junction of the two forks and look for moose there our host allowed us something for the quarter of the moose which we had brought and which he was glad to get two explorers from chamberlain lake started at the same time that we did red flannel shirts should be worn in the woods if only for the fine contrast which this color makes with the evergreens in the water thus i thought when i saw the forms of the explorers in their birch poling up the rapids before us far off against the forest it is a surveyor's color also most distinctly seen under all circumstances we stopped to dine at ragmuff as before my companion it was who wandered up the stream to look for moose this time while joe went to sleep on the bank so that we felt sure of him and i improved the opportunity to botanize and bathe soon after starting again while joe was gone back in the canoe for the frying pan which had been left we picked a couple of quarts of tree cranberries for a sauce i was surprised by joe's asking me how far it was to the moosehorn he was pretty well acquainted with this stream but he had noticed that i was curious about distances and had several maps he and indians generally with whom i have talked are not able to describe dimensions or distances in our measures with any accuracy he could tell perhaps at what time we should arrive but not how far it was we saw a few wood ducks sheldrakes and black ducks but they were not so numerous there at that season as on our river at home we scared the same family of wood ducks before us going and returning we also heard the note of one fish hawk somewhat like that of a pigeon woodpecker and soon after saw him perched near the top of a dead white pine against the island where we had first camped while a company of peetweets were twittering and teetering about over the carcass of a moose on a low sandy spit just beneath we drove the fish hawk from perch to perch each time eliciting a scream or whistle for many miles before us our course being upstream we were obliged to work much harder than before and had frequent use for a pole sometimes all three of us paddled together standing up small and heavily laden as the canoe was about six miles from moosehead we began to see the mountains east of the north end of the lake and at four o'clock we reached the carry the indians were still encamped here there were three including the st francis indian who had come in the steamer with us one of the others was called sabattis joe and the st francis indian were plainly clear indian the other two apparently mixed indian and white but the difference was confined to their features and complexion for all that i could see we here cooked the tongue of the moose for supper having left the nose which is esteemed the choicest part at chesuncook boiling it being a good deal of trouble to prepare it we also stewed our tree cranberries 
viburnum oculus sweetening them with sugar the lumberers sometimes cooked them with molasses they were used in arnold's expedition this sauce was very grateful to us who had been confined to hard bread pork and moose meat and notwithstanding their seeds we all three pronounced them equal to the common cranberry but perhaps some allowance is to be made for our forest appetite it would be worth the while to cultivate them both for beauty and for food i afterwards saw them in a garden in bangor joe said that they were called ebiminar while we were getting supper joe commenced curing the moose hide on which i had sat a good part of the voyage he having already cut most of the hair off with his knife at the kakongamok he set up two stout forked poles on the bank seven or eight feet high and as much asunder east and west and having cut slits eight or ten inches long and the same distance apart close to the edge on the sides of the hide he threaded poles through them and then placing one of the poles on the forked stakes tied the other down tightly at the bottom the two ends also were tied with cedar bark their usual string to the upright poles through small holes at short intervals the hide thus stretched and slanted a little to the north to expose its flesh side to the sun measured in the extreme eight feet long by six high where any flesh still adhered joe boldly scored it with his knife to lay it open to the sun it now appeared somewhat spotted and injured by the duck shot you may see the old frames on which hides have been stretched at many camping places in these woods for some reason or other the going to the forks of the penobscot was given up and we decided to stop here my companion intending to hunt down the stream at night the indians invited us to lodge with them but my companion inclined to go to the log camp on the carry this camp was close and dirty and had an ill smell and i preferred to accept the indians offer if we did not make a camp for ourselves for though they were dirty too they were more in the open air and were much more agreeable and even refined company than the lumberers the most interesting question entertained at the lumberers camp was which man could handle any other on the carry and for the most part they possessed no qualities which you could not lay hands on so we went to the indians camp or wigwam it was rather windy and therefore joe concluded to hunt after midnight if the wind went down which the other indians thought it would not do because it was from the south the two mixed bloods however went off up the river for moose at dark before we arrived at their camp this indian camp was a slight patched-up affair which had stood there several weeks built shed fashion open to the fire on the west if the wind changed they could turn it round it was formed by two forked stakes and a crossbar with rafters slanted from this to the ground the covering was partly an old sail partly birch bark quite imperfect but securely tied on and coming down to the ground on the sides a large log was rolled up at the back side for a headboard and two or three moose hides were spread on the ground with the hair up various articles of their wardrobe were tucked around the sides and corners or under the roof they were smoking moose meat on just such a crate as is represented by with in debris collectio peregrinationum published in fifteen eighty eight and which the natives of brazil called bucan whence buccaneer on which were frequently shown pieces of human flesh drying along with the rest it was erected in front of the camp over the usual large fire in the form of an oblong square two stout forked stakes four or five feet apart and five feet high were driven into the ground at each end and then two poles ten feet long were stretched across over the fire and smaller ones laid transversely on these a foot apart on the last hung large thin slices of moose meat smoking and drying a space being left open over the centre of the fire there was the whole heart black as a thirty-two pound ball hanging at one corner they said that it took three or four days to cure this meat and it would keep a year or more refuse pieces lay about on the ground in different stages of decay and some pieces also in the fire half buried and sizzling in the ashes as black and dirty as an old shoe these last i at first thought were thrown away but afterwards found that they were being cooked also a tremendous rib piece was roasting before the fire being impaled on an upright stake forced in and out between the ribs there was a moose hide stretched and curing on poles like ours and quite a pile of cured skins close by they had killed twenty-two moose within two months 
but as they could use but very little of the meat, they left the carcasses on the ground. Altogether, it was about as savage a sight as ever was witnessed, and I was carried back at once three hundred years. There were many torches of birch bark, shaped like straight tin horns, lying ready for use on a stump outside. For fear of dirt, we spread our blankets over their hides, so as not to touch them anywhere. The St. Francis Indian and Joe alone were there at first, and we lay on our backs talking with them till midnight. They were very sociable, and, when they did not talk with us, kept up a steady chatting in their own language. We heard a small bird just after dark, which, Joe said, sang at a certain hour in the night, at ten o'clock, he believed. We also heard the hylodes and tree-toads, and the lumberers singing in their camp a quarter of a mile off. I told them that I had seen pictures in old books, pieces of human flesh drying on these crates, whereupon they repeated some tradition about the Mohawks eating human flesh, what parts they preferred, etc., and also of a battle with the Mohawks near Moosehead, in which many of the latter were killed. But I found that they knew but little of the history of their race, and could be entertained by stories about their ancestors as readily as any way. At first I was nearly roasted out, for I lay against one side of the camp and felt the heat reflected not only from the birch bark above, but from the side. And again I remembered the sufferings of the Jesuit missionaries, and what extremes of heat and cold the Indians were said to endure. I struggled long between my desire to remain and talk with them, and my impulse to rush out and stretch myself on the cool grass. And when I was about to take the last step, Joe, hearing my murmurs, or else being uncomfortable himself, got up and partially dispersed the fire. I suppose that that is Indian manners, to defend yourself. While lying there listening to the Indians, I amused myself with trying to guess at their subject by their gestures, or some proper name introduced. There can be no more startling evidence of their being a distinct and comparatively aboriginal race than to hear this unaltered Indian language, which the white man cannot speak nor understand. We may suspect change and deterioration in almost every other particular but the language, which is so wholly unintelligible to us. It took me by surprise, though I had found so many arrowheads, and convinced me that the Indian was not the invention of historians and poets. It was a purely wild and primitive American sound, as much as the barking of a chicoree, and I could not understand a syllable of it but Paugus, had he been there, would have understood it. These Abenakis gossiped, laughed, and jested in the language in which Eliot's Indian Bible is written, the language which has been spoken in New England, who shall say how long. These were the sounds that issued from the wigwams of this country before Columbus was born. They have not yet died away, and with remarkably few exceptions, the language of their forefathers is still copious enough for them. I felt that I stood, or rather lay, as near to the primitive man of America that night as any of its discoverers ever did. In the midst of their conversation, Joe suddenly appealed to me to know how long Moosehead Lake was. Meanwhile, as we lay there, Joe was making and trying his horn to be ready for hunting after midnight. The St. Francis Indian also amused himself with sounding it, or rather calling through it, for the sound is made with a voice and not by blowing through the horn the latter appeared to be a speculator in moose hides he bought my companions for two dollars and a quarter green joe said that it was worth two and a half at old town its chief use is for moccasins one or two of these indians wore them i was told that by a recent law of maine foreigners are not allowed to kill moose there at any season white americans can kill them only at a particular season but the indians of maine at all seasons the St. Francis Indian accordingly asked my companion for a wig higgin or bill to show since he was a foreigner. He lived near Sorel. I found that he could write his name very well, Tomunt Swayson. One Ellis, an old white man of Guilford, a town through which we passed not far from the south end of Moosehead, was the most celebrated moose hunter of those parts. Indians and whites spoke with equal respect of him. Tomunt said that there were more moose here than in the Adirondack country in New York where he had hunted, that three years before there were a great many about, and there were a great many now in the woods, but they did not come out to the water. It was of no use to hunt them at midnight. They would not come out then. I asked Sabattis, after he came home, if the moose never attacked him. He answered that you must not fire many times so as to mad him. 
i fire once and hit him in the right place and in the morning i find him he won't go far but if you keep firing you mad him i fired once five bullets every one through the heart and he did not mind them at all it only made him more mad i asked him if they did not hunt them with dogs he said that they did so in winter but never in the summer for then it was of no use they would run right off straight and swiftly a hundred miles another indian said that the moose once scared would run all day a dog will hang to their lips and be carried along till he is swung against a tree and drops off they cannot run on a glaze though they can run in snow four feet deep but the caribou can run on ice they commonly find two or three moose together they cover themselves with water all but their noses to escape flies he had the horns of what he called the black moose that goes in low lands these spread three or four feet the red moose was another kind running on mountains and had horns which spread six feet such were his distinctions both can move their horns the broad flat blades are covered with hair and are so soft when the animal is alive that you can run a knife through them they regard it as a good or bad sign if the horns turn this way or that his caribou horns had been gnawed by mice in his wigwam but he thought that the horns neither of the moose nor of the caribou were ever gnawed while the creature was alive as some have asserted an indian whom i met after this at old town who had carried about a bear and other animals of maine to exhibit told me that thirty years ago there were not so many moose in maine as now also that the moose were very easily tamed and would come back when once fed and so would deer but not caribou the indians of this neighborhood are about as familiar with the moose as we are with the ox having associated with them for so many generations father rails in his dictionary of the abenaki language gives not only a word for the male moose ayanbe and another for the female herar but for the bone which is in the middle of the heart of the moose and for his left hind leg end of part two section fifteen recording by expatriate in bangor maine